Today we're starting a, a new worship series, and that worship series is called Not So Silent Night. And uh, I want to take a little poll here. First off, how many of you did some holiday decorating uh, over the week, over this last week, right? Uh, I have realized something, uh, that there are two distinctly different kinds of holiday decorators. There are some of you who, uh, let's just say you get really excited when in October, Target starts putting out their holiday displays because you're the kind of people who need that permission to start decorating early around your house. The earlier the better. Raise your hand if you're someone who's sort of an earlier the better Christmas decorator. We got a handful of folks, right? Okay, a few more. Uh, and then there are the rest of you, us who are kind of maybe uh, Christmas decorating purists. Like you can't put up even a, a strand of tinsel or any lights or that nativity scene till after Thanksgiving. You got to give Thanksgiving its due. Raise your hand if that is you, a few more of you. Well, whatever your Christmas decorating proclivities are, here's the deal. We are in the season of Christmas. We are in full swing Christmas mode. This last weekend, Santa lit up Broadway on uh, the Hallmark Channel now. You can watch any sappy Christmas movie you want 24 hours a day. And at our house, maybe like your house, we have Christmas music playing all the time. How many of you like Christmas music? Got your Christmas playlist, right? And there are all kinds of favorite Christmas carols this time of year. Joy to the world, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. All kinds of carols. But one of the things I've realized is that for us as Christian people, there's one Christmas carol that sort of stands out above all the rest. It is a, a carol that's been sung in Christian churches on Christmas Eve for ages. We're going to sing it at all seven of our Christmas services as we close the service. We're all going to be holding candles. The lights will be down. And that Christmas carol is, any guesses? Silent night. Silent night. And here's what I want to say about that Christmas carol. I think it's rather ironic that Silent Night is the carol that we love to sing as Christ Christian people on a holiday that celebrates a mother giving birth to a child. Because here's the story, I was at the birth of my two children and it was not a silent night, let me tell you. It was anything but silent. I love my wife, but for about six hours, she turned into this monster that made noises I've never heard her make sense. She taught me a few words I had never heard before during that period. I mean, it was unreal. At several times, she looked at me and she snarled, you did this to me. Huh? And I tried to make light of the situation, kind of lighten the mood at one point. I said, honey, you're the birthinator. She didn't think that was funny. Huh? I mean, isn't it a little bit ironic that on this, this holiday that celebrates a mother giving birth, we sing a song called Silent Night? I mean, there were, giving birth is not calm, it's not bright, it's not tender, it's not mild. And then if your experience was all like ours, we get sent home with this child. And I'll never forget, we walked into the house and the child was crying. I looked at my wife, she was crying. Then I started crying because I realized in that moment there would never be another night of heavenly sleep in our rest of our lives. Hmm? You see, isn't that a little bit ironic? And we start with this today because here's, here's what I want us to wonder about for the next several weeks as we get ready for Christmas. I want to wonder about this question right here. Is another silent night what any of us actually needs? That might sound like a weird question, uh, and I don't want to offend anybody who loves that hymn because I love it too and we're going to sing it till the day I die. But I want to wonder with you, is another silent night what any of us actually needs? Because here's what I think. If your life is at all like mine, I've had more than my share of long silent nights. I think we all know long silent nights. There's that long silent night 
When we get that phone call from the doctor that says that scan came back irregular and there's going to need to be some more tests. There's the long silent nights as family members go through cancer treatment. There's the long silent nights of trying to dig yourself out of financial holes. There's the long silent nights when that relationship with your spouse is on the rocks. And you have those long silent nights wondering if this is going to be the marriage that you ever be the marriage that you dreamed of. There's those long silent nights wishing your family would just get along. Long silent nights worrying about your kids, whether they're six or they're 60. Uh, This year for Christmas, our family got together and we bought my wife uh, a gift that's better than diamonds. It's better than a closet full of clothing, better than a fancy new sports car. We bought my wife, are you ready for this? A microwave. Hmm? We've reached that stage in life. Huh? And we bought this for her, and, and I tell you this story because as we were checking out, uh, we had this conversation with the, the man, the salesman, and he asked us, how was your Thanksgiving? And we said it was great, and then we said the same to him, how was your Thanksgiving? And unprompted, he, he said, actually, this Thanksgiving was really quiet. He said, my daughter is separating from her husband. And it just seemed so quiet this year. When I was uh, 10 years old, 35 years ago, uh, in the fall of the year, my mother got sick. And she ended up in the hospital And she spent several months in the hospital. And I remember as a 10-year-old boy asking my dad, Dad, when is mom going to be home? When's she going to come home? Uh, If any of you have 10-year-old boys in your house, they might not tell you this, but they need you moms more than you'll ever know. And there was a long, silent night, December 13th. I'll never forget, we were gathered in our house, and it was my grandma, my grandpa, my sister, and I, and the phone rang in the middle of the night. And it was a phone call from Rochester where my mom had been in the hospital. And it was a phone call that shared with us that she had passed. You see, here's what I think. I think for most of us, we, we have had way too many long, silent nights. And so what I want to suggest today is that the story of Christmas maybe isn't so much about a silent night. Because when we look at the Christmas story, here's, here's what I know about the Christmas story. Uh, in that ancient world, those people, they had more than their share of silent nights, just like you and me. I think about Mary. Mary had endured nine long months of silent nights, humiliated because she was pregnant. And in that society, you just weren't pregnant unless you were married. She had endured nine long, humiliating months Because she claimed that this child wasn't her husband's. And you better believe that there were rumors flying around town. And Joseph himself, he must have had all kinds of doubts during those long nine months. Who was the father of this child? And we know he had those doubts because the Bible says he was thinking of divorcing her quietly. And then they had that long, silent night, that trip all the way to Bethlehem. But here's the thing. It seems like the silence begins to break when they arrive in Bethlehem. Because you better believe that Mary wasn't silent when they realized there wasn't a room for them in the inn. And you better believe Mary and Joseph weren't silent when they realized they were going to have to give birth in a barn. And I got to believe that that night was anything but silent when they gave birth to that child in that barn out behind the motel, surrounded by animals. You see, here's what I think I want to wonder with you about as we march towards Christmas. I think the Christmas story is all about this. It's about the silence being broken. Those long, silent nights of our lives being broken. There's an author by the name of Philip Yancey who sort of whimsically writes about Christmas cards, those sappy Christmas cards that fill the, the, the aisles at Target this time of year. He wrote, inside the Christmas cards this time of year, they stress sunny words like love, goodwill, cheer, happiness, and warmth. I suppose that we honor a sacred holiday with such homey sentiments. But he goes on 
And he says, and yet when I turn to the gospel accounts, to the story of Christmas in the Bible, I hear a very different tone and and sense mainly disruption at work. You see, I think the Christmas story was God's way of disrupting the long silent nights that God's people had experienced in that ancient world. And we see as we go prior to the birth story, prior to Mary even being pregnant, that there are signs that this is to come. There's a story about two characters, Elizabeth and Zechariah, and we're going to take a look at that story today. Prior to the birth story, we read in Luke chapter 1, in the time of who? Herod. Now, hey, a little history lesson. Herod was a brutal king. He was a terrible king. He was sort of a puppet king for Rome. He had two jobs. One was to collect the enormous taxes Rome wanted from the people of Judea. But his second job was to tamp down any uprisings that happened throughout Judea. And he did it with brutal force. The history books tell us that that Herod actually was so brutal, he had two of his sons killed. He had a wife killed and two of his brothers. This was a bad dude. And the people of Judea, they lived under this day in and day out. And so for as long as the people can remember, they had prayed to God, God, give us a new king. God, send somebody into this world, a savior who's going to save us from this injustice, save us from this brutality, save us from this violence. Well, the story goes on. It says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named... Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. And if it goes on, it says, his wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. And it goes on, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive And they were both very old. Zechariah was a priest. And they were unable to have a child. And in that ancient world, it was believed that that if you couldn't have a child, it had something to do with a spiritual deficiency. And I imagine for Zechariah being a priest, this was really hard. He was supposed to be a leader when it came to spirituality in that community. I imagine he even, he even considered leaving his wife of divorcing her so she could marry someone else because surely she would be able to have kids with someone else. And so you got to believe Zechariah prayed and prayed and prayed, God, give us a child. God, please give us a child. In fact, now in their old age, I imagine he had given up on that prayer because God had long since forgotten about that prayer. So he believed. He believed that 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 prayer was no longer good and so he quit praying that prayer long, long ago. Well, the story goes on and it says, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Once in a priest's lifetime, maybe he would be selected to actually go into the temple. And there in the temple, he would pray the prayer that everybody prayed He'd pray again and again like everyone would pray in this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. God, send your son. Send a Messiah. Send somebody who's going to come and save us from our enemies, who's going to wipe out the Romans, who's going to be a warrior king and take down Herod. And the story goes on. It says, And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then, help me here, and angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled, and he was gripped with fear. And then it says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, and say this with me, your prayer has been heard. And I imagine Zechariah went, what prayer? What prayer? I'm a priest. I pray all kinds of prayers. And the angel kept going. Your wife Elizabeth 
will bear you a son, and you are to call him John, and he will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Join me here to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I imagine Zechariah said, no way, this cannot be. I've given up on that prayer long ago. God heard that prayer, and God didn't do it. This cannot be. And that's why he asked this, he says this to the angel. He says, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. He said, I'm too old to have children. This just can't be. But the angel says to Zechariah and Elizabeth, you're going to have a child. God's going to provide you a child at an unexpected time in an unexpected place. This child's going to come to unexpected people. And your child, John, is going to do unexpected things. Your child is going to be a special child. That child is going to point the way to that other prayer you've been praying. The one who's going to come and take care of your people. You see, there's going to be another baby that that child is going to point to. And that baby's going to come in a really, really unexpected way. And it's going to do really, really unexpected things. And I imagine Zechariah and Elizabeth, they said, no way, this can't be. We stopped praying that prayer long ago. So here's my question for you. When I think about Zechariah and Elizabeth, I wonder for all of us, what prayer have you stopped praying? What prayer have you stopped praying? Prayer you prayed long ago, God, it felt like, didn't hear it. God, would you make this depression go away? God, would you allow our family to get along for one holiday, please? God, would you help my relationship with my husband? I just, would you make it work? God, that son, that daughter, would you bring them home this year? Have you ever wondered what prayer is it that you have stopped praying? Because that's the prayer I think Christmas is all about. The story says that if we go on, when his time, when Zechariah's time of service was completed, he returned home. And after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and take away my disgrace. Elizabeth rejoiced because God heard her. You see, I think here's the thing about Christmas. I think Christmas isn't so much about that silent night as it about, is about Jesus. Jesus who came to break our long silent nights. Those long, silent nights that we know all too well. You see, the announcement of Christmas is that in the midst of our hurt and our pain and our muck and our yuck of everyday, ordinary life, that we have a God who, like Elizabeth, like Zechariah, a God who hears you. And whatever mistakes you've made, whatever bumbles along the way, just like it was for Elizabeth, you never need You never, ever have to walk in disgrace. You see, here's the thing. I think that's how it was for Mary. It's how it was for Joseph, how it was for Zechariah, Elizabeth, for those shepherds out in the field. God came to disrupt the night, that long, silent night they had all experienced. God broke into the world as light amid darkness, as light. Uh, we had some friends uh, who lived on Lake Latoka. And in the middle of the night, uh, one night they were startled, they were awakened by a light that shined into their house. The brightest light they'd ever experienced was shining into their bedroom window from the lakeside of their house. And it was 
bright. They jumped out of bed, they told us. They threw on some clothes. Uh, the wife grabbed the phone to call 911. They, they had no idea what was going on. I'm sure he ran to get his gun or whatever. And they went downstairs and, and they sort of peeked through the window. And guess what they saw out on the lake? It wasn't any perpetrators or anything like that. It was carp fishermen. Hmm? Have you ever seen this? Carp fishermen with their big lights? Huh? You see, here's the thing. It was that light that shattered their long, silent night. And if you ask me, that's what Christmas is all about. It's about God breaking into this world to shatter the darkness of all of our long, silent nights. Let me pray for you as we close. Gracious God, you know that some of us, we have these long silent nights that are pretty, well, they're out, everybody sees the pains that we experience. Others of us hold them inside and we often don't let others see. But God, remind us that the story of Christmas is all about you coming in and disrupting, interrupting that, those long silent nights we experience with the gift of your son, a gift of hope, a gift of love, a gift for all people. God, we give thanks for this. We pray this in your name. And all God's people said, 